You're listening to the Kingdom Project Podcast. These are discussions on biblical theology and interpretation. The emphasis is on context and grace. The goal is to promote biblical literacy by displacing and debunking most modern interpretations. The challenge is to engage in healthy conversation that may stretch, but sharpen iron. This is The Kingdom Project, and I'm your host, Marcus Hall. We are rethinking. We looked at the story of Zacchaeus, and I think uh, we redeemed him in that. <laughs> if it needed to be done, I think, <laughs> I think maybe it did, uh, compared to those uh, children's Bible stories that we read. So we are uh, going to continue to rethink, and today I'm going to give you an advisory. Uh, I've sometimes given advisories here, uh, <laughs> and, and before, before my sermons. Like I said, I'm not intentionally trying to disrupt anything. I have not... I am not the black sheep because I have chosen to be be one. Um, uh, I I could go, you know. I remember I just told this story to somebody not too long ago, but you know, I I remember praying to God and getting saved when I was about in seventh grade. I was in bed by myself at night and I prayed for forgiveness. And I would say I've been saved since then. Of course, I did not live the Christian life. Uh, I was in and out and in and out, and then a, a period of time happened um, later in our lives, and after we had gone through many, many, many things, and I'm sitting in my work truck in the uh, parking lot at Hux in Carbondale in 51, and I just remember praying again like and, and saying, you know, I'll give it, I'm going to give it one more try. <laughs> Like, like as if I need to give God one more try, right? He'd been there the whole time. But I said, I, I want to know everything the way it's supposed to be known. And I want to know how to read your word, understand your word. I want to know you in the way that we should know you. So I wanted the truth. And it took a little while from that point, but the truth started to come. And when the truth started to come and I started to see it and learn how to read the Bible... I started to notice that there's a lot of things that we've learned in church that aren't in the Bible, (laughs) okay? There's a lot of things in our our songs and our hymns. We have hymnal theology. We have worship theology. We do. Um, And there's the whole debate on orthodoxy and tradition and things like that. And there's nothing wrong with those things. Nothing wrong with, with, with tradition, okay? Um, tradition is good. It can be really good. Um, heritage and legacy goes with tradition, and those things are good. This place has been around since the 1800s. I mean, that's that's a good heritage. And uh, I'm honored to be a part of the, the history of this church now. Okay, so um, when, when, when something comes up, I want you to guys know, like today... Don't turn me off as soon as I tell you what we're rethinking, because it turns out good, okay? So, <laughs> so today we're going to rethink the tithe. We're rethinking tithing. No one get upset here, okay? <laughs> There's a lot of preachers who will not say the things I'm about to say. And they'll say it, that they will be honest and say, I can't do it because they're afraid of losing paychecks. They're afraid of losing their house. Um, and, and then, of course, the overhead, the expenses. There is obviously expenses to be paid here, right? Well, so there's money to, that has to be given for that. So is it biblical is first? Is tithing biblical? And the answer is yes, it is. But everything biblical is not applicable to us today. That does not mean that. You don't have to do this, though. But you'll understand what I mean when we start to go through this. Okay? So the reason why I want to talk about it and for you to rethink it is because if you don't know, I, you need to know. I, I believe we're all entitled to know. All right? A lot of people feel that there's, it's burdensome because they can't make the 10% cut. If they can't make the 10%, 
what's the, the, what's the bother to even try, right? So therefore, they can't make it. So they're not going to be under a certain blessing from God. That's how many are taught. Blessings or cursings. Uh, some people will say if one does not tithe, then they are under the condemnation of God. But the word says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ, right? So that's, that's wrong. <laughs> uh, I, these are quotes I found. I have doubts that a person who does not tithe is a Christian. People say that. People say it from the pulpit, make people feel burdensome. Uh, the yoke of Jesus is light, though. All right? We're not to be burdened. So it's an area of great confusion in the church. All right? And so is it a mandate for us? All right? So how many, have you, uh, ha- how many of you have been taught in, in your lives that you are supposed to tithe? That you have to. You're obligated. 10% goes straight to God, first and foremost, all the time. It's how, teenager, I was mowing lawns, doing landscaping. It's all the time, 10%. 10%, always, right, from my money. Grandpa would, 10%. <laughs> it gets ingrained. It's good. It's, it's okay, though, to know that it's okay. It's great to learn how to budget money. It's great to know what you should do. It's good to want to give. But I was like, or 10%. 10%. <laughs> then you get married <laughs> and then you and your wife are fighting or disputing maybe debating not fighting really is it is it the is it gross is it the gross or the net right. what do you want uh, gross blessings or net blessings that's what's her response no <laughs> yeah okay so we're always doing the gross. I'm like, but I, we didn't receive, we didn't receive the gross though. <laughs> Why? <laughs> right? And then bonuses and tips. Okay, here we go. Always ten percent. Okay. So we've been taught that it's we're obligated. It's mandatory. It's like a commandment. We have to do it. All right. Yeah. And she said the gross blessings are the net. Like you're not gonna get it off. You don't. If you're not tithing the, the, the gross. All right. And I finally stopped for a while. <laughs> but then, then you get to another point we were at. So I'm just sharing personally that we have to give until it hurts. Give if you don't have it. So we're given. And she's going on Sunday after evenings to go grocery shopping and the card's getting declined because we don't have enough money in the bank. <laughs> but we've been given. We're given. So she's using the credit card for the groceries so and then we can make the credit card payment when we get the m- money in the bank. Right? But then always giving more. And then it happens again over and over. Don't understand. What's, I thought we were in this spot of being blessed here we should be prospering at this point did that for months right <laughs> right wasn't it for a while though well it wasn't i mean yeah it was it, yeah. yeah and it was just like oh uh, and i'm and right and it started and that's the thing it started coming up like she wasn't working anymore of it we had a child have single income and i know it's a long intro but uh yeah, it, it, we have bills. We can't buy groceries on a credit card and then but give. But we're told you have to. It's not right. I don't believe that's right at all. That's not biblical either. Okay, so when somebody's telling you these things and they're teaching that we have this, it's a God bill. We pay your phone bills, your mortgage bills, your insurance, and then you've got to pay your God bill too. If you don't pay your God bill, then... His collection agency's after you, somewhat to speak. His heavenly <laughs> collection agency, right? You're obviously not getting blessed because you're not putting enough faith into what you're giving. We've heard that. We've heard, well, then you need to give more. The blessings haven't come yet. The floodgates aren't coming yet. All right? It's going to rain down on you eventually. I've heard pastors say, don't even start. To write that check until your hand is shaken because, yo, that amount is scary to write. 
Yes. Huh? <laughs> She'll get mad on us. All right. Tithing is biblical. It's taught in the Bible. All right. It's in the Old Testament, but even in the Old Testament, it was not giving like we're told today. Okay, it was the giving was voluntary. It was always voluntary in Old Testament. The tithe, on the other hand, there's a difference. The tithe was a debt. It was a taxation. This was not giving at all. All right. Just like we pay our taxes, Israel had a tax. That was the tithe. Okay. So tithing was tax, taxation under the Mosaic law. All right. Some people teach that we should tithe because tithing precedes the law because of Abraham and Jacob. All right. They gave a tithe before the law even existed. So tithing should also be after the law. We know we're not under the law, right? We're not under the law. We're under grace. We're in the new covenant. But when somebody, when people say stuff like that, then should, they should also say, um, that's like saying the sacrificial system, we should be doing that too. Because there were sacrifices, offerings given before the law. So, you know, have you guys sacrificed a, a turtle dove lately? You know, um, have you killed an animal? I know you haven't. <laughs> and if the church started to preach that, you would probably leave the church. <laughs> I think most of us would. All right. The first mention of that is in Genesis 14. If you want to look, turn there, you can. All right. But this is Abram and this mysterious character, Melchizedek, which we don't have time to, to explore him. But he represented God. But if you see there in Genesis 14, 20, and I know it's just a, it's a middle of a sentence, but it said, And blessed be God, most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Okay? So, if you know what was going on here, this is like all this stuff, crazy stuff. Okay, but he gave a tenth of his spoil. It wasn't even his anyway. <laughs> all right? He wanted to express thanks to God for the victory that had happened. He gives a tenth to Melchizedek, who represents God. But he wasn't told to do this. It was completely voluntary. Okay, And the word spoils, like I said, it's the top of the heap. It's the best of the spoils. So Abram gave a tenth of the best, not the, not the whole lot of it. So that's what's going on there. It wasn't even his anyway, but he gave it. He only did it one time. That's it. It's the only time he ever did this. So if we were to base that on preceding the law, uh, we'd only have to tithe one time in our life if we based it on that. Now the next use of the word tithe is in Genesis 28. <clears throat> verses 20 and 22. And it says, Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I, that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And the stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And, and of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. And Jacob was nowhere here commanded to give a tenth. Again, this is voluntary on his part. Okay. So we could go over a lot of things. Who, who, what's the first mention of an offering in the Bible? It involved a murder. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> right? Voluntary as far as we know. Doesn't mention God commanding that. Noah got off the ark, gave God an offering. Voluntary. Before the Mosaic Law, tithing is only mentioned twice, and there's no command to do it. All right. Now, during the Mosaic Law, tithing became a familiar term. So as we study the Old Testament, we'll see there's actually more than just this tenth. There's more than one tithe. There are three. Okay. And remember, these are taxations. The first one we find in Leviticus 27. <clears throat> this is... The Levites tithe. Now, do you guys know the Le who the Levites are? 
Let's do some Old Testament quizzes here, all right? All right, as, as, as God's giving out the land, giving out the inheritance and all this, Levites, they don't get any. <laughs> they don't get anything. We'll see this here. They're going to be the priests, though. They're going to be the ones who are going to go into the tent of the meeting or the temple and the tabernacle. They're the ones who are going to be interceding, all right, for Israel. So they're not given anything. Okay, so Leviticus 27, 30, 33 says, Every tithe of the land, whether the seed of the land or of the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If a man wishes to redeem some of his tithe, he shall add a fifth to it. And, if, uh, and every tithe of herds and flocks, every tenth animal of all that pass under the herdsman's staff, shall be holy to the Lord. One shall not dif uh, differentiate between good or bad, neither shall he make a substitute for it. And if he does substitute for it, then both it and the substitute shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. Now, I'm not going to exposit everything here. I'm not... If you're familiar, the first five books of the Bible, all right, so, uh, has to do with all this stuff, all right? So we have Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers. Go to Numbers 18, okay? Because there we're going to be told that the tithe was collected and given to the Levites, okay? So Numbers 18, uh, 21 and 24, there's a lot of, it's, it's hard to follow a lot of stuff in the Old Testament. There's... And it's not in a good order either. Um, it would be so good to get one that was actually in order and to just let you know where. Like Job, Job, the book of Job is like, that should actually happen like probably right after the fall. Like we should read the first three chapters of Genesis, then read Job and then go back and, and start in chapter four of Genesis. Things like that. It's really interesting to, to find those things, okay? But Numbers 18, 21, 24, it says, To the Levites... I have given every tithe in Israel for an, an inheritance. Okay, so they've not received this land or anything like that. They're receiving this tithe in Israel for an inheritance in return for their service that they do. Their service in the tent of meeting. So that the people of Israel do not come near the tent of meeting lest they bear sin and die. But the Levites shall do the service of the tent of meeting and they shall, they shall bear their iniquity. So it shall be a perpetual... A statute throughout your generations. Who, whose generations? Who is he talking to? Right? Among the people of Israel. It, he goes on and says, and among, the, so the Levites throughout their generations and the, among the people of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. For the tithe of the people of Israel, which they represent as a contribution to the Lord, I have given to the Levites for an inheritance. Therefore, I have said of them that they shall have no inheritance among the people of Israel. Okay, so the Levites didn't have the privilege of a piece of property that they could work to make their living like the other tribes. They were to do the Lord's work in the tabernacle and the temple. And so God is providing for their needs by giving this Levite tithe to all of Israel. Okay, so old covenant Israel, we have to remember was a theocracy. Do you guys know what theocracy is? Okay, no. That's a government by the rule of God. Okay? It's mediated through the priests. We, we, we don't live in that. We have that. Don't have that today. So the tithe is collected as a taxation to support the government. It's tax. Okay? And it was mandatory. The second tithe is the festival tithe. We see this in Deuteronomy Chapter 12, and there's a lot of text today, so sorry, you know, if you're following along. <laughs> Going all over, but it's all right there, the first five books. Deuteronomy 12, 6 and 7, <clears throat> starting again in the middle. I'm sorry I'm doing this to you, but it's just to make the point here. This is that, and there you shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes, and the contribution that you present, your vow offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and of your flock. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your households, in all that you undertake, in which the Lord your God has blessed you. This is for a festival that's going on, okay? There's feasts and festivals in the Old Testament. Now, if you go to, to chapter 14 in Deuteronomy, 
And there will be a part here I'm sure you've never <laughs> heard spoke on before. But Deuteronomy 14, 22 and 26. Okay. It says, you shall tithe all the yield of your seed that comes from the field year by year. Okay. Obviously, we're not all farmers and everything anymore, so we, we do money, right? They're doing seed here. And before the Lord your God, in the place that he will choose to make his name dwell there, you shall eat the tithe of your grain, of your wine, and of your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and flock, okay? So that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. So they're going to go to a place that God has chosen and eat, partake in these things for the festival. They're supplying what they have to bring to the festival to eat, partake in, okay? It's Deuteronomy 14, 22 through 26. Now, it goes on to say that, and if the way is too long for you, and you're not able to carry the tithe when the Lord your God blesses you because the place is too far from you, which the Lord your God chooses to set his name there, then, this is always makes me laugh, I don't know why. You shall turn it into money. You bind up the money in your hand, so now you don't have to bring all this stuff with you. You sell it, got the money, bind it up, stick it in your pouch or whatever. All right. Uh, in your, go to the place the Lord, your God chooses. And then spend the money for whatever you desire. Oxen, cheap, wine, or strong drink. And yes, strong drink there is exactly what it means. <laughs> so, never heard somebody preach on that. <laughs> Use your tithes for strong drink. <laughs> That's why it makes me laugh. But whatever your appetite craves, and you shall eat there before the Lord your God and rejoice you and your household. Okay, so this second, this second tithe was, uh, to, was to be taken to the central sanctuary of the feast uh, sacrifices. It was also to promote unity within the tribes. So we have the, the Levite tithe and the festival tithe. That comes to 20%. So now we're already 10% more than what we've been taught. <laughs> but there's another one, okay? There's the poor tithe. <laughs> so Deuteronomy 14, 28 and 29. It says at the end of every three years... You shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in the same year and lay it up within your towns. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow uh, who are within your town shall come and eat and be filled, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands that you do. Okay, so this is once every three years. It was a special edition uh, additional income tax in order to take care of the poor within their land. Okay, so it's poor tithe or a welfare tithe is what it's called. But they were to they were to leave also to leave the corners of their fields unharvested and let the poor have that part. So God's taking care of everything here, all right? If you see that. If you notice what's going on, he's taking care of it all. You guys are going to provide all of this. It's mandatory. This taxation is happening. All right. Even when you go to the place that I tell you to go to, to, to celebrate, you're going to bring your stuff and do it. All right. So this worked out now. Now we're up to 25% a year. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so it, that's not much different than our taxation, though, that we have, right? That's going on. All right. So I know most of you said you've been told to do this. Now, if you've ever been in church any length amount of time, or if you've watched stuff on TV, it won't take long to get to this next verse. And I hate, oh, <laughs> you talk about getting fired up. I hate when people use this verse, especially today. It's in Malachi chapter 3. Yeah. So some of you already know what I'm talking about. Say Malachi 3. That's the big one. This is the one you're going to hear from some pulpits today to get you to pull out your checkbooks in that moment. 
Now, I know as we're going, I've seen some looks on y'all's faces. Don't get all sour. <laughs> it is what it is. People twist Scripture. All right? People misuse it. People misinterpret it, but people also use it for their financial gain as well. It happens, okay? This is another reason why I want to present this to you guys, all right? I remember a friend of mine coming over one, at one time, and he said he had given every last penny that he had to this pastor on TV. <clears throat> because the pastor on TV was going to send him a handkerchief that he prayed over and blessed, and he was to carry that in his wallet at all times, and money would just start pouring in. And it wasn't even a real handkerchief. It was just a printed one on a piece of paper. And he pulled that out, and he was like, this here, this, uh, you know, I was like, he was like, I only had like 40 bucks in the bank. Gave it all. He, he didn't, you know. All right. <laughs> Sorry. I just, people feed on the poor. They feed on the hurting. They, they feed on those that are sick and lonely. And they do it with things like this. God's saying, do this right now. Get $40, it'll come back to you fourfold, right? 40 days in the uh, wilderness, 40 years in the wilderness, 40, 40, 40 is in the Bible, 40 is the number. God's saying, send me 40 bucks. The only one that's getting richer is the guy on TV, okay? So Malachi 3, 8, and 10. <clears throat> it says, will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. So you are cursed with a curse. For you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you blessing until there is no more need. So people are say you're robbing God if you're not giving and you're not going to give on top of your tithe and with your offerings. You'll be robbing God, all right? He's not going to open the windows of heaven for you if you don't give. That's what that one's used for all the time. Okay? What that verse is, these verses there are really teaching is that Israel has cheated on their taxes. And if you're cheating on your taxes, you've robbed God under the Mosaic law. All right? Remember, the tithe was taxation in the theocracy. And the storehouse was the temple treasury. All right? The tithing was mandatory under the old covenant. And that's what he's saying there. You've not been doing it, so you've robbed me. Therefore, there's, there's blessings and cursings, okay? Two, Deuteronomy, all that, it's in there. A lot more curses than there are blessings. What's, what's funny about that is the blessings that he announces, there's no response, but for every curse they are say amen. <laughs> really odd. All right. So, that's the taxation. That's the tithe. Old covenant Israel Mosaic law, okay? Now, if you were to look at other examples in, in the Old Testament, like in Exodus, for example, Exodus chapter 25. Now, this is in reference to the offerings for the temple. Okay? 25, 1 and 2, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel that they take for me a contribution from every man whose heart moves him. You shall receive the contribution for me. Now there, notice, there's no 10% mention there. All right? There's nothing there. This is... Um, and, and when you go on, uh, on further in Exodus, Exodus chapter 35, 4 and 5. This is, Moses said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, this is the thing that the Lord has commanded. Take from among you a contribution to the Lord. Whoever is of a generous heart, let him bring the Lord's contribution. Gold, silver, silver, and bronze, okay? Now, again, no 10%, nothing here. This is about a contribution to give. In chapter 35, it, it well, let's just look at it. Exodus 35, 21, 22. 
All right. Following in all this context that's going on. And they came, everyone whose heart stirred him. All right. Those whose heart stirred him came. And everyone whose spirit moved him. And they brought the Lord's contribution to be used for the tent of meeting. And for all of its, its service and for the holy garments. Okay. So, and then it goes on. But then t- verse 24. Everyone who could make a contribution of silver or bronze brought it as the Lord's contribution. So it's everyone who could here. They're giving. Okay. And it goes on. There's more examples there if you read that. Those, so that section of Exodus. <clears throat> There's no percentage here mentioned. They were given voluntarily out of a willing heart. The same things happened when David wanted to build a temple. The people's attitude was the same. That in First Chronicles, it says uh, in 29.9, it says, Then the people rejoiced because they had given willingly for with a whole heart that uh, they had offered freely to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. So, this here, they're doing it because they wanted to. They're rejoicing. They're giving as they could. Okay? Now, giving is worship. It, it's also voluntary, though. It's voluntary. <laughs> no amount is specified. The tithing, old covenant, Israel, taxation, that's not giving. Okay? That's tax. Giving, as we've seen, has always been on a voluntary basis. And the, the amount was also voluntary. And it's the same in the New Testament, okay? So now we move to the New Testament to make the case. Now we know what about and, and when they ask Jesus about giving to the government. It's in Matthew 22, 17 uh, through 22. They ask about Caesar, okay? Give you guys a second. It says, tell us then what what you think. Is it it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, why why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin. I can just see him. Show me the coin. Just give me the coin. (laughs) So they brought him a denarius, and Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled and they left him and went away. Essentially, I would say what Jesus is saying here is he's, pay your taxes to the government and give God your voluntary giving. OK, the tithe is never imposed on new covenant believers. We don't live in the theocracy. And I would encourage you, if you have a concordance in the back of your Bible, but depending on the translation, if you look up the word tithe and it's plural in the New Testament, you're only going to see that it's used eight times. All right? It's found once in Matthew, twice in Luke, and each one is referring to the Old Covenant. And it's used five times in Hebrews 7, but it's speaking of a time uh, before the giving of the law, and it's talking about when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. So tithing is never mentioned as a command to New Covenant believers, and it's never mentioned in any of the letters to the churches at all in the New Testament. Okay? Now, strictly speaking, if you want to be real hard-lined here and try to defend your position on that we are mandated and obligated to tithe today, then according to that law in Deuteronomy 12, the tithe was to be paid in Jerusalem. So, we are, um, if, you, if we are under obligation to that, we are 2,000 years too late and thousands of miles too far away. All right? Are you going to go do that? Who's going to Jerusalem to give their tithes? And where do, you, where do you go once you get there? There's no temple. Right? Yet still many impose it to the new covenant believers today. So what people who say that God is, is, is blessing them because they tithe, right? Um, I, I'm not going to deny God's blessings on people. Right? I'm not going to do that at all and say God's not going to bless you if you give or don't give. Right? 
His blessing is because of the attitude of giving, right? It's the heart motivation. Much like when we looked at Zacchaeus, you know, and his heart's posture towards the Lord. That's what the Lord is seeing. It's the motivation of the heart, right? The heart speaks of your actions and what you're doing. That's what Jesus is addressing in the whole Mount, uh, Sermon on the Mount, right? The inside, the heart speaks what's going on, right? It's not because 10%. It's not because of any percentage whatsoever, right? When people say that God's blessing you because of this, that reason, that's just a method, methodology that's wrong, all right? Because God blesses the willing giver. So if we are not under this tithe, and we're not, and people are to give on a voluntary basis, then what's going to motivate them to give? Because a lot of people think, well, now you just lost all, all the church's income, right? <laughs> That's why people don't want to preach about it, like I said. Now, look, stats really show that mo most Christians who do tithe, they only give 3% anyway. Okay? So, <laughs> uh, but like I said, some people don't give it all because they think it has to be 10. They can't do the 10, why bother? I'm not going to do it, right? I won't be blessed. Why would I give seven or three if I'm going to be put under a curse or in condemnation, right? So people don't. So I think if we actually talk about this and put it out like this, chances are people may start actually giving if it was just 1%. Because they're going to be like, whoo, I can just give, whatever, that's cool. And then they'll find out too that if you're going through hardship, if you've got some bad stuff going on that... If we want to follow this mandatory obligation of the old covenant, then we need to start collecting a poor tithe to help somebody when they're in need here in the body. Right? We should be doing that anyway. Not collecting the poor tithe, but helping when somebody's in need financially. Right? That's what the money and stuff is to go for besides just the overhead. All right? So the motivation, uh, you could actually say, for me, I would say it's biblical doctrine. Because I'm a nerd. <laughs> but what I mean by that is understanding what God has done for us in Jesus. Right? Understanding this helps us to want to give. Makes us new. Grace giving is voluntary giving because of gratitude. Because of thankfulness for an act of worship. We give out of a heart of love and worship. Now 2 Corinthians 8. Now set. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 is all about stewardship in Paul, all right? It's all about all sorts of different things. We can't go over them all. can't read it all. But it's all about stewardship, <clears throat> okay? Now, 2 Corinthians 8, 7 and 9. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in, your love, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of those that your love is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he become poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Now, I'm not going to use that <laughs> for money. <laughs> All right. There will be people that's going to use that for money. <laughs> In Christ's poverty, you can become rich. Everyone in the kingdom should be rich. Still preaching that today. Charismatics are big on that. We should all be billionaires. Uh, <laughs> serious. Hear that. Uh, spiritually rich, spiritually alive. You were dead in his poverty and his death. We become alive now. We become new. We are made new. We are complete, right? New creations. We will prosper in that. All right, so this, this favor, this gratitude, thanks, and kindness, is, this great, the word grace is used of the atonement of Christ. And Paul says here that grace should lead to grace. In other words, grace shown to us should lead to, to grace in our lives, showing to others and showing to God, but in giving as well. So our motivation for giving is not legal. It's not a taxation. It should be out of love. It should be out of gratitude from a worshiping heart. And go to the next chapter, chapter 9 in 2 Corinthians and 6 and 8. 
And Paul says the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. People misuse that too. (laughs) Big time. All right. So I'm not going to go into that. Here's the point here. Seven. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. All right. So as you have decided in your hearts, don't be reluctant about it. Not under compulsion. Right. Oh, under compulsion. You know, don't write that check into your hand shaking. Give it till it hurts today, people. Where's the plates? Let's pass them around. <laughs> right? That's what they do, man. They hit you right between the eyes. Give you these. You're robbing God and now going to put you under compulsion. Pass the plate around. It's important to see that right there. As you have decided in your heart. Okay? If you want to you make that between you and the Lord, certainly. Go ahead. That's fine. But as you have decided in your heart, you'll give, but you won't be reluctant about it and you won't do it under compulsion. Now, one thing, one people will point out, and I'm going to address it. I'm almost done. Sorry. 1 Corinthians 16. All right. Because some people would say, what about this? So I need to hit it upon this. Let's be short. Okay. 16. uh, 1 through 4. Okay. Now, concerning the collection for the saints... This is Paul. As I directed the churches of Galatia, Galatia, so also are uh, are to do. You also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper. Important phrase there, as he may prosper. So that there will be no collecting when I come. When I arrive, I will send those whom you uh, uh, accredited uh, by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me, right? All right. Now, this is similar in character with uh, 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, all right? The collection seems to be for the saints of Jerusalem, the poor there. And they are the same recipients as uh, in 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 2 Corinthians, all right? So it appears that the Jerusalem saints were in, in great need. So that these Corinthians, Macedonians, and, and also the Galatians were contributing to help their needs, okay? We have to remember, this was first century. And so, he has a reference to storing for the poor on the first day of the week, all right? First day of the week is on one of the Sabbaths. So what Paul is saying here is that each one should make some sort of a fund for the poor, storing there. On one of the Sabbaths, as he may prosper. The rule is not a percentage. The rule is not a tithe. It's to store up uh, something, but it's not to store up your tithes. It's to store up as you prosper. The church was supposed to store up in accordance to the resources, okay? 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, like I said, it takes us further. It adds adding the desire, the cheerful, the non-grudging giver, plus other, other types of elements there. And the Apostle Paul is encouraging believers to give according to their means. In other words, each person was to give according to what he or she possessed. All right, If they didn't have it, you don't give. People with greater wealth could give more, and those with less would not give as much. The reason that Paul gives... Uh, Concerning the necessity of the time was that of that contribution is that he says, I don't want any collections to be taken up when I come. That's important. So he didn't want it to be erratic, compulsory, uh, or compulsory uh, giving when he showed up. He didn't even want it to take place when he showed up. Right. He'll collect it. And we don't even know. If this would continue forever here, 
Probably not even for this purpose. There was a specific purpose, a purpose because it was to help the poor saints in Jerusalem, and you can find that in Romans 15. But it, it were done on a regular basis on that one day of the week until Paul arrived, so that they would not be done at haste when Paul would come. So after Paul had come, they may have not even continued to do this. That would be the context, all right? So... If we, sur- if we survey the New Testament, we'll find that it does not prescribe a formal method or fixed amount for believers giving it at all. All right. But it does provide several examples and principles of giving that can guide us in our stewardship and our giving. All right. So I've not destroyed the tithe. I've not taken it away. That's why I was giving you guys an advisory. You'll still give. I know people are still give. Right. But I wanted you to know you're not going to be under curse. You're not going to be in condemnation if you don't. You give what you've come to in your heart. You give what you want to. You give accordingly. You give as needed. It can be periodic. It's personal. It should be planned. And it should be proportionate of what you have. And it should just be given cheerfully. Because genuine love for God and growth in our Christian lives result in mature giving hearts that leads to more grace because we're under grace. And a heart that's dedicated to Jesus cannot help but to be generous toward God, uh, God and his people.